will try to give you a throw or something. <laughs> Thank you. I would be so grateful. Like, I wish I would have brought a coat. If I would have known, I would have brought a coat. I wish I had brand new words. Thank you. Hi, baby. Hi, baby. Hi, baby. Hi, baby. Hi, baby. I know. I was thinking yeah. this is where you get it. Will he subscribe to the journal? There, you're doing one. How much is our house? Um, you'll have to go to the website. It's your classic um, academic journal, so they're, they're, they're not cheap. But individual subscriptions are a lot cheaper. I know. I know.
seats, we can begin our discussion. That is when time expands. <laughs> I wonder what that says about us. Okay, well, we will have people here to pass microphones in the audience in just a minute, but we are not going to wait for them. We will just begin. Uh, and please feel free to address questions uh, to individuals or to the panel as a whole. And panelists, uh, feel free to respond to any questions, even if they're not directed to you, uh, that you feel are important from your point of view. And we generally like the what we call the two-finger intervention. So if a fellow panelist is speaking, that's how you cut in. <laughs> All right. Um, but let's begin. And if, I, if you could please introduce yourself uh, before asking a question, uh, let's open it up. Questions from the floor. Good, we answered it all. Yes. Oh, here it comes. Uh, thank you. I'm Caitlin Antrim. I'm with the Rule of Law Committee for the Oceans. Um, I'd like to get two related things. One is how does increased access through the internet and through other uh, technical means, how does that promise to give greater involvement to residents and indigenous people of the North in the national policy making? And second, particularly, uh, Willie, can you give us more examples of lessons we might learn from the uh, Barents cooperation process that, that we don't see perhaps between US, Russia, and Canada in the other end of the Arctic? Caitlin, uh, thank you. I just uh, two two reflections. I, I think uh, not just speaking of the communications with with indigenous peoples, but communication about the Arctic and the issues. One of the concerns we're having again as we're focusing on the uh, upcoming U.S. chairmanship is trying to enhance the Arctic Council's own communication. Uh, the permanent secretariat of the Arctic Council in Tromsø, Norway. How do we access this? How do we make this more accessible uh, to everyone? And, and we need to think about much more creative strategies on that public diplomacy policy. Uh, but getting to the to the community point, we need to look at a whole range of, of issues for indigenous um, energy efficiency, trying to get them away from using diesel fuels and, and more renewables, how to help we're having to move populations because of coastal erosion and uh, subsist uh, subsistence uh, fishing and, and hunting uh, patterns are, are dramatically changing. So there has to be an enormous amount of work uh, there with, with the indigenous communities. And, and quite frankly, there has to be larger capacity building efforts with the permanent participants at the Arctic Council to help strengthen their own voice. Just the cost of travel and just the capacity of sitting around the table with uh, uh, large countries, government delegations, how do we have their voices heard, their issues heard? This is a whole range of issues that as the Arctic Council matures, uh, we really need to think through how those issues work. And I think internet connectivity uh, amongst indigenous experts, scientists, that's going to be an enormous part of the work ahead for the Arctic Council. Yes. Well, OK. Well, thank you very much. Excellent question, as always. Uh, uh, two parts. First and foremost, it's broadband is the first response, is the problem. It's just the issue that when you get to the high north, connectivity is just as Heather suggested. It's just so difficult and so problematic. Um, it's expensive, uh, it's difficult, and, but it's necessary. And this is one thing I think that the Arctic Council is starting to consider. This is part of the one of the sub-mandates that the Economic Council is supposed to be dealing with. But let me address a second issue that we don't tend to talk about so much in polite society, and that's there's a certain pushback and concerns in terms of the participation of Indigenous peoples in such forms such as the Arctic Council. One of the things, of course, that we tended to downplay entirely in North America, and I don't fully understand why, 
is that we see the Russian government moving against the indigenous participation. They're doing it in subtle contexts, but they are doing it. Rapion, which is the major Russian participation of the indigenous peoples, was in fact delisted. Now, was it because uh, they got caught up with the Russian move against NGOs? This isn't entirely clear, but they delisted them and only turned around and said, okay, well, the charter that has been in existence for about 20 years that we should have checked 20 years ago is finally up to date. There's also a language issue. They've moved against some of the rights that the indigenous peoples have made for language rights in Russia. And so part of the problem that we're facing is that we tend to try to put on a positive face always with the Arctic Council without dealing some of the, 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 these fundamental issues in terms of how we see the participation. The third issue that's going to be a major factor, and this is an issue that the indigenous part of the permanent participants are very concerned, and this was part of the reason why Canada specifically did not openly embrace the addition of the new observers um, at the Arctic Council is the fear that countries such as China, Japan, Singapore that do not have a pr uh, the same type of appreciation for northern indigenous rights as say Canada or the United States a will not fully understand there's a learning process but more importantly there is a real concern that the observers will drown out the voices of the indigenous peoples not in terms of, of deliberate participation but because they simply can't afford to be there a lot more and it gets back to Heather's point that the indigenous groups simply face such economic difficulties in getting there if they can't get to any of the meetings but the Chinese Japanese can always show up with full signs how do you have the full participation that is envisioned under the Arctic Council. This is a forthcoming problem that I, is going to be one that I think we're going to have to address very seriously. Thanks. Uh, Willie and then Marlene. Yeah, I, just a question of clarification. You talked about the Barents Sea process. Do you mean the delimitation line? The, the, uh, <coughs> the involvement of regional and local governments in the. Okay, okay, process. okay. Well, well that's, that's a book <laughs> you're asking me to read. But could you give me the practice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, as a starting point, this was one, this area, um, the Barents Sea, was one of the uh, hot spots during the Cold War. We, uh, and the one reason being, of course, that uh, the, northern, uh, the, the Soviet Northern Fleet was based at the Kula Peninsula, and they used the Barents Sea to reach the high seas uh, to use their weapons if need be. Um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and after um, uh, the Soviet Union uh, or, or, or the, 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 the images of, of the Cold War, so to say, uh, was reduced somewhat, the Norwegian uh, uh, Foreign Minister Thomas Stoltenberg took the initiative that he wanted to take this potential conflict-ridden region to make it into a cooperative region. And he joined in with the Russian uh, Foreign Minister Kosryev at that time, and they, uh, they decided that they should try to establish a kind of sub-Arctic collaboration uh, in the area. <coughs> so what they did was to try to transform the northernmost counties of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and, uh, and, and Russia to integrate and to become economic growth regions on their own. Because all these regions were at the outskirts of, of the respective four countries, and they needed support from the capitals in order to survive. And they wanted to do something with it. And at the same time, um, trying to have them work together, uh, they, they, caused, they, they made up uh, what they called a regional council, where the heads of all, all the counties of the four countries met regularly to try to build down uh, the boundaries and, and to try to increase trade cultural exchange, etc., etc., And to help them in that, they also created the Barents Council, which is, which is where the government meets and try to help the regional governments to integrate in the high north. Uh, so there are a kind of two-tier 
a collaboration on the government and on the regional level. And um, I can tell you that this, this initiative on the part of the Norwegian foreign minister was very com uh, controversial, uh, even in the foreign ministry of Norway. There were so many of the civil servants, high ranking, that was against it. But he, he <coughs> said, okay, this is, this is my project, I will do it. And he did it together with, uh, with uh, Kosarev and then gradually also with the Swedish government and the Finnish government. And uh, this is a collaboration that are restricted basically to collaboration on land between all these 13 counties that's involved. It, only in one respect, it deals with the oceans and that in environmental affairs. And it was also a precondition in this respect that this collaboration, which is multilateral, should not, um, uh, should not be a problem for the bilateral collaboration going on between, in particular, Norway and Russia in the Barents Sea when it comes to fishery management, when it comes to environmental management of the environment, etc. So that's the short version. Okay, Mar Marlene, thank you. Marlene? Yeah, very briefly, on the, I mean, as it was said, the, the situation of indigenous people in Russia is really probably where it's the most fragile for them. And they are really part of nothing. I mean, they are really totally excluded of the decision making processes, both centralized and uh, uh, at the local level. And there is no way for them to, uh, uh, or no way for us to imagine they would be able to be integrated given the current situation. But I would be even more pessimistic, even if, and the, because the point is not only that uh, Putin's attacks World uh, uh, NGOs and so on. Globally, even if you had political opposition in power, I don't think they would give them anything just because they are decredibilized mm -hmm. as, as, uh, as partners with whom you take uh, decision globally in Russia. Uh, uh, so the only way they can really communicate, it's not only communicate inside the country, it's really communicate abroad. And that's why the role of RIPON was so important at the Arctic Council, that only because they were abroad and under this kind of media, international media visibility, then they could pressure uh, the Russian government. Otherwise, inside Russia, I think it's really impossible. My only concern is that the way the Arctic Council and other uh, uh, institutions tend to formulate indigenous issues seems to me more and more outdated because we continue to think in terms of preserving traditional way of life. But if you look at what is going on in Russia in, for indigenous people, it's a growing trend for them to be part of, they want to be urbanized, they want to participate in the regional development, they want to be involved in energy exploitation. So their status as a kind of second class citizens, I mean, they will still be second class citizens, but their status has drastically changing because the point is no more preserving way of life, it's being integrated in this kind of modernization processes. Okay, quick comments from Willie and Rob. Yeah, a very quick one. Um, I want to add to what was said because I agree. Uh, there is one problem that arises in this respect and that is um, there is an increasing appreciation for traditional indigenous knowledge in the management of the Arctic. And uh, we saw this also during the negotiation for the uh, new declaration of 2014, where they are saying, okay, we, we can't say how to manage fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean. We need more, mon we, me we need more knowledge in this respect. We need more science. And then a comma and indigenous knowledge. And my question is, how do you merge scientific knowledge with indigenous knowledge? In principle, I'm fully subscribed to the need to utilize actively um, indigenous traditional knowledge. But how do you merge it? There has been no try to do this. So until we start working on merging this kind of, of knowledge, it seems as if they don't treat traditional knowledge the way, the serious way that they should. 
is something that they add when they say, okay, we need more science uh, in this respect, and then they add, we need also some more utilization of traditional knowledge. Rob and then Aki. Yeah, very quickly. I mean, I, I agree entirely with what Marlene was saying in terms of the inner workings with Russia. The one place where I would disagree a little bit is in terms of the Arctic Council's effort to, in fact, recognize that the indigenous populations do, at least part of them, do want to join into the economic component. In fact, the indigenous economic community that Canada is now trying to push is very much more focused on indigenous economic opportunities rather than sustainability. It's created a, a, a counter to the prevailing North American stereotype, and it is a stereotype that the indigenous peoples do not want to participate, and it's created one of those interesting tensions. If you want to look for tensions on the Arctic Council, look at the permanent participants, particularly the ICC, in what's happening in groups such as Greenpeace or the Pew Foundation. There are substantial tensions between those groups that are pushing for a conservation movement within the Arctic mm -hmm. and those who live there and say, you know what, if we want to develop oil and gas for our, our kids, we want to have the right to do so. What's interesting is this is where the EU gets brought in, and this is where Canada has had major issues with the Europeans when they've come forward after developing the North Sea and all other areas, have turned around and said, okay, well, we've developed the North Sea, but you can't develop the high Arctic. Now, there's all sorts of environmental issues with the Arctic, mm -hmm. but it grates the indigenous groups to say, okay, you know, uh, UK, because it's, it's been Lady, um, uh, I forget her name anyways, being a big spokesperson, um, yeah, you, uh, Lady Wallace, um, UK has done really well under North Sea, and now you're telling us we can't do it? The problem, of course, ultimately, we know if there's a spill in the Arctic, it, you're not going to clean it up. So it's all about having the technology to deal with it so that doesn't happen. Now, how do you do that? Um, that's the real issue. So these tensions are developing, but we have to get rid of the stereotypes that the indigenous peoples are automatically in step with those groups mm -hmm. that say no, no development. And I, th I think this is one thing we have to be very sensitive sure. to. Aki. Yes, in relation to what Rob and Marlene, uh, what Marlene said, um, in, uh, in Greenland, for example, the re reaction to foreign uh, companies coming in is very different from perhaps in uh, some of the indigenous community or uh, population in Canada. Um, they very much welcome um, Chinese investment, for example, or uh, Korean uh, investment because they have had a long history with Denmark and uh, unfortunately there was not enough economic uh, Invest, uh, economic interest or investment from Denmark. So their, their position is that they would rather work with Danish companies if they had a choice, that they understand the language, they share um, similar standards and norms, um, but that's not the case. Um, therefore, I, I think there, there's a, a division amongst, as you mentioned earlier, that amongst indigenous so-called indigenous population uh, also, uh, towards um, economic development and who, who is going to fund that. Yeah. We have Michael and then all the way to the back. Michael Yehuda from uh, George Washington University. Um, I think the various speakers have, have said various things about the Arctic Council itself. I've heard quite a number of differences that have been referred to within the Arctic, the members of this circle. And at the same time, the uh, permanent observers have their own separate concerns. <coughs> and I've, I've also, uh, if I'm right, heard that the Arctic Council is more based on consensus. So in view of that, in view of the various differences, how do you envisage the Arctic Circle developing? Is it really going to be able to set, uh, if you like, rules or norms or uh, identify how differences can be overcome? Oui. Okay. Well, I think that the Arctic Circle is an interesting phenomena, uh, also in, in light of what I tried to say in my uh, brief presentation, namely between the Arctic 8, 5, 3, 6, and 2. Uh, I wonder if the Arctic Circle, which was an initiative taken by uh, the <coughs> President Grimson in Iceland was one frustration uh, uh, 
was based on a frustration by the president and the Icelandic government that there are so many voices that is not being heard. Because the Arctic 8 is a self-declared uh, uh, group of nations that has taken on the responsibility of managing and administering uh, uh, the Arctic and the Arctic Ocean in this respect. I, I just recently heard that Mexico is now um, uh, planning to send a, 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 an application to, to the Arctic Council to, be, to become a, a permanent observer. And of course, the permanent observership in, in the Arctic Council is growing and growing and growing. It's becoming bigger and bigger. And uh, so I think it, on the, on the one hand, the Arctic Circle may reflect an Icelandic frustration about being not being kept within the internal the inner circle of the Arctic uh, of the Arctic Eight and at the same time it will relieve it may relieve the Arctic Eight the Arctic Council from some of from everyone to become an observer because it's not only states that becomes observers but also institutions in the independent institutions and uh, and uh, that is the part of the Arctic Council that's growing the fastest and there is a, a, a reluctance on the part of many of the pr of, of the of the permanent members of the Arctic Council to open op open it up for more uh, observers to come so I think that the Arctic Circle will become a big meeting ground, a venue for all of those that do not be in, is being heard uh, among those that really de makes the decisions when it comes to the Arctic. And that's the individual Arctic countries and the Arctic, uh, and the Arctic Council, and of course sub-Arctic institutions like the Barnes Euro Arctic region, etc., etc. We have Heather and then Rob. Yeah, I, there's just not uh, an answer to that question right now. We are in an extraordinary phase of, of experimentation and maturation of the Arctic Council. I think looking at 2009, and again in, in, in U.S. terms, uh, in leading towards 20, 2011 when the first Secretary of State actually attended an Arctic Council ministerial, this has been transformative. Two international agreements uh, using the Arctic Council framework, uh, a permanent secretariat, now these new permanent observers. So all of this motion and very exciting developments, the institution itself has not digested any of it, quite frankly. We don't know how to implement these agreements because we don't have the institutional structures to do it. We have to figure that out. We don't even know how this permanent secretariat is going to uh, you, you know, develop. And of course, this, this uh, bringing in these permanent observers, this is, this is really, I, uh, we've termed it that in some ways, the US chairmanship actually needs to focus on what I call fixing the plumbing. I mean, we have this wonderful now new house that the Arctic Council has built. Now we got to make sure the water, you know, the plumbing works, the electricity works. And this is just institutional strengthening. It's not very attractive, sexy policy making. It's actually making what you've just agreed to uh, work. I think, well, I, I, for me, I'm not sure I can define what the Arctic Circle is or is not. I, I can't quite figure out whether it's a complement to the Arctic Economic Council. It's more of a business development forum, which allows Asian investors and others to, uh, certainly as, it's been, as it was hosted in Reykjavik, understand the opportunities that Iceland is as a regional hub. Um, but uh, what it did serve, in my view, it was a big nudge to the Arctic Council last year on the permanent observer question because it put to the uh, member states, well, do you want to find a way to bring in these other voices? Or are they going to find their own competing organization and may challenge the Arctic Council 8 uh, on who gets to sort of set the pace and the tone? I think that was a helpful nudge to get to the right answer, which I think is including the permanent observer observers. But now the council doesn't know what to do. And we're going to be learning as we're doing. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have uh, concerns by Canada and Russia of, of greater intrusion. You'll have those, I think, the US was less concerns, but trying 
trying to figure out what it's going to cost us. How does that work? We are just in this huge experimental stage, quite frankly, and no one has the right answer. Rob. Two issues, just to be clear. I mean, uh, to, uh, to a certain degree, your question was asking really, I think, about the Arctic Council. Uh, there is a second organization, the Arctic Circle. And uh, uh, ultimately, the response to the expansion of both is politics. I mean, once again, we talk about cooperation. We talk about this is all good, normative, good stuff. You know, everybody loves holding hands and saying we're going forward. But the Arctic Council's success, as it has moved into the creation of actual treaty making, such as the search and rescue and the other efforts, really comes down, down to whether or not the Americans take it serious. One of the most frustrating aspects for Canada, for Norway, for Finland, is the fact that the Americans have been such a reluctant partner. It was the U.S. that said, we don't want a permanent secretary. It was the U.S. that said, we don't want it to be hard law. We want it to be soft law. We want it to be cooperative. Once the Obama administration, and particularly Hillary Clinton, begins to take it serious, observers of the Arctic Council basically see it transform literally before our eyes. We get a permanent participant. We start getting funding into the creation of hard law. And so really at the root of the Arctic Council success is whether or not you can convince and keep the Americans engaged to a very large degree. You need to keep the Russians there. Of course, Canada and Norway and Finland have to have the ideas, not that we're going to have the money for it. But I mean, basically, <laughs> If the Americans take it serious, all things are possible. Sure. If the Americans don't take it serious, we go back into this sort of nice meeting fest. Now, <laughs> politics again for the Arctic Circle per se. Let's not lose sight of what was happening here. Iceland, once again, not only was it an issue being left out on the A5, the Icelanders were really ticked off for the American manner in which they withdrew their F8, uh, F-15s from uh, Iceland back in 2006. They thought that they were being abandoned. Second of all, when the economic crisis comes in, because the Icelanders had put all their banking into the Lehman Brothers, you know what happened in 2008 with Lehman Brothers. They went bankrupt, and Iceland became the first developed country to go bankrupt. And the EU and North America refused to step up to help them. So there's a real strong sense of resentment in Iceland overall. And so the, the president of Iceland actually publicly stated in 2009, hey, North America, you have forsaken us. EU, you have forgotten us. Of course you should not be surprised that China and India are our new best friends. And I suspect that had the Arctic Council gone a different way on observers and said no to China, because it was China that was paying for the Arctic Circle, even though Iceland was pushing it forward, you would have seen some institutionalization that Heather was referring to that would have been funded, or at least underfunded, by China, but being led by Iceland. And so recognize the geopolitics within the geopolitics that are occurring here. Uh, we're back in the corner. Um, we'll over here. Good morning. Thanks for doing this. My name is Paul Coring. I'm with the Globe and Mail. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the sort of the, the pragmatism as opposed to the politics, and I want to pick up on something that Rob had said about the uh, Russians in the Northeast Sea Route have, in effect, established uh, de facto uh, not just escorting but fee taking and control well beyond territorial waters, and I wonder. Um, if each of you, because you're all speaking about either states with maritime interests and transit interests <laughs> or states uh, um, that, that have territorial interests or in the case of the United States, uh, both plus uh, security okay. interests, um, does that de facto establishment um, <coughs> set a pattern uh, in the Arctic? And will that pattern rub up against very quickly uh, the international law of the sea. I, I, can, I can start. Um, I, and I think very much touching on Rob's presentation, we're about to test those propositions for both the Northern Sea Route and the Northwest Passage. It's been more theoretical and more anecdotal, and we've had workarounds, pragmatic workarounds. Um, so charging for icebreakers and navigation assets, that's a fee, and that's, you know, how do you build that in? It's only until we really start seeing significant commercial interest in pursuing this that we're then going to test if are these internal 
uh, waters or international water. We haven't just we haven't really been fully testing both those propositions. Look, the reason why the Chinese are buying building their second icebreaker is so they don't need Russian icebreakers. And my goodness, if if the sea ice really does uh, uh, diminish to an extent where what happens when transpolar you're going outside Russian EEZ, you're not going to require that passage anyway. I mean, some of this is very futuristic. And I think we have to be quite uh, modest. And you know, shipping companies are telling us that easy on the this is the no, next Suez Canal for the Northern Sea Route. There's a lot of um, diminished interest for shipping companies uh, for these passages for a whole host of reasons. We have to. We sometimes get a little ahead of our geopolitics, and we don't sort of understand completely the commercial dynamics here. But we're going to test these theories. I, I think you know, from the U.S. position, there has to. Be be great consistency in how we approach both the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route. They, they have different variations, but on the same theme. But we'll see how quickly and how extensively uh, both routes are tested. And then the international community, it won't just be a US response, how the international community responds to that. I want to ask a question, actually, based on something you said, Heather, and something you said, Rob. Um, which is about capacity, whether we're talking about building ice uh, breakers or scientific research or extractive industries. It sounds like a lot of the capacity and the will is now with China. And we spoke, I guess, last week, Anne-Marie, about uh, Chinese capacity in the Antarctic. And I wonder how much you see that Chinese capacity being a, a, a driver in these issues, which are in some ways related to security and sovereignty. Uh, going forward, if they're the ones who can, in fact, afford to, to invest there? Is that something we need to be watching? Uh, yes, I can reply to that. But didn't we want to follow the, uh, did we, we, do we need to have a little bit more of an answer to the question that Heather answered? I thought we had a little bit more on, on, on that. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Rob, do you want to counter yeah, me, I please? <laughs> yeah, um, I got to jump in on that. I'd be disappointed if that would not be the case. <laughs> One of the things that's fascinating, and I hinted at this in my presentation, is that the big fear I have is Canada will be the whipping boy because nobody wants to take on the Russians. Now, once again, Anne-Marie made reference to the fact that publicly, the Chinese officials are saying these are international straits, but have a look at the fact that a Chinese research vessel that, by the way, has very good ice scaping capabilities, just went through the Northern Sea Route. Have a close look at how the Chinese did it. They were in complete compliance with Russian requirements. They set the precedent of a government official vessel that paid the fee and followed what the Russians said. If that's not an acceptance of Russian domination over the Northern Sea Route, I don't know what is. So the precedent has been set. It's been very quiet. They're not publicly acknowledging it. But dig a little deeper to see in that context. Now, the problem we face, and we get back to Heather's point here, is the fact that you're going to get someone who doesn't appreciate the sensitivity of Canada-U.S. relations and say, oh my goodness, if we do not make a statement and a stand here, the Gulf of Hormuz or the Philippine Seas or other ways are going to come to challenge instead of recognizing, you know what, the Arctic is unique. And oh, by the way, since 9-11, we like having secure borders that may in fact affect the whole issue of freedom of navigation. And if you really want to look for exceptions of freedom of navigation, look at the applications of the Jones Act, in which the Americans very nicely make sure that the only people that ship oil between Alaska and anywhere else, now by the law, you have to go California or Hawaii first, but the only shipper that is allowed to ship oil from the port of, uh, of Valdez has to be American under the Jones Act. And so you talk about freedom of navigation, well, you know, everybody does it. You fit your interests and there's not these overarching principles in this context and I think we have to be very sensitive to that to the larger politics rather than saying well there's a principle yeah principles right <laughs> Willie yeah well um, all the transit that has been undertaken through the northern sea route or northeast passage I would say uh, since 2009 have complied with Russian regulations and they have paid their fees so actually um, the Russian position is being stronger and stronger because yeah. of this. And there is another, uh, another way of thinking about this, because we are talking about freedom of navigation, we are talking about high seas, and, and we can just cross over the transpolar um, 
uh, area and uh, and uh, we do not have to comply with this well there is a reasoning within uh, Russia that the northern sea route can be defined as four different routes mm -hmm. it's a coastal route very close to the coast it's a marine route going through some of the 52 different straits. There is a high latitudinal route going north of the archipelagos. And there is what they call a near the pole route that is close to the North Pole, which implies that, and the reasoning, the legal reasoning in this respect is this. If you go through parts of the Northern Sea route, the coastal route or the marine route. You have to use some of those waters. And because of the ice, you will have to zigzag your way out into high, the high seas. It doesn't matter. It's part of the, um, the Northern Sea route. And the Russians and the Soviets before them defined the Northern Sea route to be an internal national sea route and a full an unlimited jurisdiction. So it's not uh, that easy. Uh, uh, this, this, this was actually a reasoning that was published in Marine Policy in 1990, just before uh, the Soviet Union uh, went into pieces. Um, and it was not commented in, in Western media at all. But then we started the International Northern Sea Route Program in 1993, which was a collaboration between Japan, Russia, and Norway. And I was uh, the head of that program. And I wrote about this, and I published it. Uh, and, and there was no, uh, and I published it in 1999. And there was no protest on, on the, the Russian part about that. Although, because they protested on several of my analysis when it came to the security implications of the developments, but not to this. And in 2008, Russian scientists employed by the Russian state came out and identified all four routes as being part of the Northern Sea Route, which is according to Russian authorities, an internal national transportation route and the full and unlimited sovereignty of the coastal state. Yeah. Anne-Marie. Right. So I can add on some value onto this debate as well as respond to um, Robert's question. So th the example that um, Robert Hubert raised of China is uh, the Shui Long having to pay the fee to go through the uh, through the Arctic Ocean and on the, the Northeastern Passage is a case in point of what I said is in, in other, uh, uh, that when China cannot effect change, it makes up the best of the current order and quietly pursues its own interests. And where there's a possibility of creating new norms, they're going to be assertive. And as Heather noted, um, there is somewhat of a flux in the moment about the regimes and what's going to work and you know there's been this kind of ambiguous situation where you haven't really had to try out what the US Canada situation or Russia no one's really had to force the issue or they did in 1963 and the US got a very strong response to that so um, China, as I mentioned, is doing a five-year project on poll resources and governance. So they are scoping and looking and seeing little windows of opportunity. For example, would it help if we go across the pole? If we, when can we go across the pole? When will the ice melt to the point that we could have a certain amount of shipping? Um, so China is kind of talking like it, it is actually the way that they're talking is talking about that these that there are there's not a actually a definite rules system in place that everybody agrees in, but they, they're following us where they have to, um, what they're asked to do. But they're looking for opportunities, and there may be opportunities because of the maybe because of the climate change. So. Um, that's a, that those examples that, that you brought up really are evidence of China's long-term interest. Unlike the US, China, and unlike all our Western democracies who are based on the electoral cycle, and have our politicians have a very short-term you know, policy 
uh, vision, unfortunately, or the average politician. China has a very long-term strategy on the, uh, compared to any of the other players about the region and globally. And so they're thinking ahead, and that they're basically they're scoping for opportunities. And they have, as as Robert asked, they have capacity. They have the resources that you know the U.S. would just love to get some new icebreakers. And that the new research vessel that China is investing in will not be a nuclear icebreaker. Actually, it's a, just a research vessel, but it'll be handy. They can go up there, and they'll be able to do more res actual research than Shirlong has been doing. With Shirlong was a cargo boat from or cargo vessel from Ukraine that is been refitted but it's you know it's not it's not b built for the purpose of which it's needed to be used um, but Chinese um, PLA spokespeople are talking about well you know you know what you need up in the Arctic that's nuclear icebreakers um, so China's policies are kind of like a watch this space but they are assiduously studying what all these other countries that we talked about here are doing and researching their policies and what works and what can you get away with? You know, where are the little opportunities there? Um, they have the resources that even, you know, Korea is very motivated about um, polar issues too, but they just, they don't have the capacity and it's been, a, they've been quite late, relatively speaking, it was sort of about 2004, there was a big turning point in recognising that they, we're not putting enough money into this. And for China, they see this as a, as a, as a really crucial, um, that it's really crucial that they have opportunity to access what, what, is, what is available in the Arctic. They first have got to work out what is in the Arctic and then how do they get it. <laughs> Your, your question on capabilities, and I, I, this very much feeds into to Russia. I mean, this is where the U.S. has extremely limited Arctic capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one heavy uh, icebreaker uh, that has just been recently uh, put back into service after some uh, engine, significant engine work. This is 1970s technology. And then we have the Healy, which is actually a research vessel that's medium strength and that can be m more multi-purpose. Our policy has been of outsourcing. So uh, this is both for both poles, uh, Antarctic and, and Arctic research. When we've required extra vessels, we have borrowed from Sweden. Uh, but when there's a, particular, a very difficult ice environment in the Baltic Sea, uh, that icebreaker has had to go back. We are studying. There was uh, put in the last fiscal <coughs> year uh, approximately $8 million for the Coast Guard to assess uh, what it would require, what it's needed. And the problem is, the Coast Guard doesn't know because they don't know what they're, you know, are we protecting, are we developing, what are the, what are the requirements? And it's very difficult uh, for us to know because we haven't figured out a, a more medium to long-term plan. This is a significant vulnerability because as we know from two years ago when Nome, Alaska needed an emergency fuel supply ship, we are very grateful that the Healy was actually there in the, in the area. It was not supposed to be. It was supposed to be uh, refueling in Antarctica from the Macardo station. We would have been out of luck. We did not have indigenous capabilities to do that. And this is where, speaking of the Jones Act, we have to really think very creatively about uh, how we're going to do perhaps joint procurement. We have not built an icebreaker in this country for well over 30 plus years. Um, and, uh, we, you know, I think there's that, that instinct of, well, if something happens in the Arctic, you know, the U.S. military, we will respond. We don't have the capabilities to respond. I wish we did, but we don't. And we're not really preparing ourselves, uh, heaven forbid, when there's a, when there's a mass uh, event, an incident, um, our resources are going to be fairly diminished. And that's something I don't think we're quite prepared to respond. If Marlene and then Aki. Yeah, just very briefly to link the, the, the two questions. I think for Russia, it's really something which is absolutely key that asserting sovereignty is really dependent on technological capabilities. And that's why the regime has been really pushing and, and able to find money to build new icebreaker. And that's where the, 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 the testing capabilities uh, uh, will, be, will be interesting to see that all the private ships that pay the fees uh, uh, to Russia, we're following the the, the, the the routes really close to the the borders. But what will happen in a 
in few years when these ships will have the capabilities of uh, taking the high latitude route and maybe we'll say, well, in that case, why would I pay Russia? And that we have no idea on what would be the Russian reaction if suddenly you have ships taking the high latitude route and uh, 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 refusing to pay uh, fees. And that's why it's so important for Russia to revive this industrial military complex. It's mostly for being sure they can take uh, uh, care of this kind of problem, at least to be able to say, well, if you try to do that, then technically, I, I mean, I have on the paper at least the, the capability to stop you. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Aki. Yes. Um, Japanese companies are going to be the user of uh, Northern Sea Route. Um, so the government, um, uh, inside the government, there is a sort of a spectrum of who should, uh, who should Japan uh, cooperate more with. And inside the foreign ministry, for example, they say, well, we need to strengthen uh, cooperation with uh, um, alliance with the US on the Arctic affairs. And um, whereas the more practical, pragmatic ministries, such as military, uh, Ministry of Land, in Infrastructure and Transportation, they think that Russia is the key player, uh, particularly with the Northern Sea Route. So um, they have uh, conducted a, a small funded uh, research project to see what are the practical implications of using the Northern Sea Route, what kind of legal limitations there, uh, how much fee, who, who's, who, who, needs to, uh, who needs to pay to what, and uh, all sorts of things. So uh, if the Arctic states, or particularly the US, that doesn't get um, uh, its act together, of course, uh, because there's an economic impetus uh, which, is, uh, which gives uh, stronger pressure to the, uh, the government, it would um, uh, it would uh, it would start uh, practical uh, it would start um, given practical solutions which is to use uh, uh, Russia um, uh, Russia's um, uh, uh, existing institutions to there was a yeah. question here in the back yes oh it is on uh, thank you Leander Bernstein with Ria Novosti uh, my question is about the uh, the worst potential security situation in the Arctic. Uh, you do have the overlap of a lot of NATO countries with Arctic Council countries, and there was a mention of the BMD systems, and as well as the increased Russian presence, the Russian Navy is going to be, uh, is going to be conducting missions in the Arctic this summer. Uh, so what, what could potentially come of the security scenario there? And also, is there a possibility for uh, the military, uh, especially the United States and Russian military, to take an active part in the infrastructure development and really forging effective navigation? I'm happy to start and let other colleagues uh, come in. I, I, you know, it, I think the most likely circumstance that would require response would either be a cruise ship that uh, encounters uh, difficulties. We've already had in previous years instance uh, similar challenges. Thankfully, they were able to, uh, uh, they were close to shore and able to be reached. Um, I think that's a more likely, or if you would have illegal fishing and two fishing trawlers deciding that they're going to have it out a little bit and have that kind of conflict, or, you know, heaven forbid, uh, an environmental incident with uh, uh, mineral, uh, oil, and gas resources, that's going to be what requires a response. And that is exactly why the Arctic Council states have, have focused on oil, uh, search and rescue and oil spill and response. It's exactly those gaps that are, that are needed to fill. And quite frankly, uh, all of the Arctic Council states have a lack of capabilities to really respond, in my view, to a, a mass incident. We can pat ourselves on the back that we have this fine legally binding agreement, but we have not, uh, they are lines on a map and show where we need to help, but that doesn't help if you don't have the Coast Guard, you don't have the vessels, you don't have the equipment there to, uh, to respond to it. So that is where I think the challenge remains. And it's not about uh, our missile defense architecture. It's not even sort of the, the, the significant military modernization of the northern fleet and, and, and how uh, the Russian government is responding with its search and rescue centers along the northern sea route and reopening previously closed bases. It's about really responding to the human and the commercial activity that uh, uh, already is in the Arctic. I actually 
have a positive view about U.S.-Russian cooperation uh, in the Bering Straits, and that's the work between uh, the U.S. Coast Guard District 17, Alaska, and FSB colleagues. Uh, we, we, we jokingly say it's because perhaps they are so far away from capitals that they're actually working extremely well together. <laughs> we, we need to continue to allow that very pragmatic uh, engagement, and this is where you know, as events uh, continue to unfold in Ukraine, we have to preserve and protect that collaboration because if there is an illicit uh, vessel that's moving through the Barren Straits, we have got to communicate with each other to track it, to monitor it, to seize it if it's something that shouldn't be there. That's in both of our interests. And uh, I, I think the, co the, I can, for the U.S. Coast Guard, I think they've been thinking long and hard about how to foster that international cooperation, even in light of the, the difficult uh, geopolitical circumstances. Thank you. Anne Marie. Oh, thank you. Um, just listening to what you were saying, Heather, about um, the lack of capacity in the region to respond to uh, some sort of crisis, and I was interested that you highlighted a potential environmental crisis because I was thinking other things. But um, that is a, um, a, like military crisis, for example. But it's, it's good to know that your, your first thoughts is um, environment. Um, you know, when the, um, particularly the Asian states were finally given ongoing status um, in the Arctic Council as observers and permanent has been taken away from them, um, that um, people ask the question, they still ask the question, what are they going to do? Like, how can they help? And um, I know that um, from one of the things that China is trying to say is that um, the opportunities in the region and the risks and the, these kind of risks in the region um, are not going to be one country responding to. It's going to take cooperation. So potentially, if you're an optimist, um, which, which I'm not, um, <laughs> when it comes to international politics, um, in life, yes. Um, but um, in international politics, no. Um, you could see a scenario for increased cooperation because certainly, at least on some areas in some parts of the region, you, there, the infrastructure that's required to take advantage of the mineral resources, the infrastructure for the sea routes, the, and the increased human presence and to respond to any potential um, environmental crises or disaster, that's going to take a multilateral effort and all these new players have like career of state of the art, icebreaker, state of the art facilities um, and they are, as, as Aki showed on the map, you know, it was funny to me that the Arctic Council has got so sniffy about China calling itself a near Arctic state. If you look at, there are many definitions of what is the Arctic and the US definition is the most broad and it goes way down really close to China and not that far from Japan or Korea either. And so these, these are countries who could be constructively engaged in the region and help out in some issues. That would be, you know, from a diplomat point of view, this is a job for the diplomats, is to to look at those kind of issues and, and take advantage of this great capacity that you have in the Asian countries and their desire to be involved constructively and, and participate in the changes going on in the region. We have Rob, very briefly, if you could, so we have time for one more question. Okay. Thank you. Well, I guess, and this is a joy of this type of a panel, I can fundamentally disagree with Heather. Oh. Um, you know, maybe this is why I don't get invited up anymore by her. No. But um, let me be clear. There will not be a conflict, a security conflict, about the Arctic per se. We won't see Canada and Russia going over the continental shelf. We won't see any of the issues. Where, though, in the long term, and I mean, I agree a little bit with Heather when she says these are the short term, and she needed, in my view, to add that adjective. In the long term, there are two driving security requirements that we don't talk about. We say they're non-Arctic, but they're occurring in the Arctic. The first is, of course, the redevelopment of both the SSNs and the SSBN fleets of both Russia and the United States. Uh, Russia has had great difficulties getting their missiles right. It's been one failure after another, but man, they have stayed the course. United States, when they were moving from Seawolf to the Virginia class, Virginia, when it was called Centurion, was told to Congress, we will be cheaper because we won't go as deep diving and we will not be Arctic capable. 
Last time I was checking, uh, there's been a series of Virginias that have been, have been publicly displayed in the Arctic through the Sinex. Sinex is a very nice way of messaging to the world, hey, we're back, and by the way, it's not just the LA class and the Seawolves that can get up here, but the Virginia class too. And so we're seeing a resumption of the old Cold War SSN, SSBN. Now it gets back to Anne Marie's point. Look at what's happening with the PLA in terms of its naval policy. They've moved to carriers. They're moving from localized to a blue water fleet. They've got Arctic interests. How long is it going to be before the PLA starts saying, you know what, with the development of the post hands class, uh, maybe we got to start thinking about Arctic capabilities. And so you got this resumption. And how far behind will the Indian Navy be? They are trying to get a, a nuclear capable sub. So we don't talk about that as Arctic. We say, well, that's sea power. That's something else. But the reality is we know that that is where the two major powers are going. We know that's where the emerging power is going to go. And then what happens is that it will not be a conflict or a security problem because it starts in the Arctic, but it spreads from other regions into the Arctic. And the second driver where I also very strongly agree with Heather is the ABM architect. Yes, it's being directed against North Korea, but watch what the Chinese are saying in terms of the fact that Fort Greeley is now being updated to 48 interceptors. And when you start adding the maritime dimension, China sees that as being directed against them, and the Russians, I dare say, say that too in their security documentation. At what point does a crisis on the Korean Peninsula not involve an Arctic orientation? And so, therefore, it's the spillover because of the architect of the submarines and because of the ABM that ultimately is, in my view, is the most serious Arctic issue that we have facing us. Okay, we have one last, oh, sorry, one last question all the way at the back of the room, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, Libo Liu of The Voice of America. Uh, I have a question for uh, Willie and Anne-Marie about uh, diplomacy between Norway and China on the Arctic issues. <laughs> How important is it, uh, is it for China to have uh, Norway on, the, on, on its side to secure a better or louder voice? And then is uh, Norway uh, doing a good job of leveraging that, uh, that asset? Uh, in bringing the uh, two nations together, or at least not falling apart, you know, after the uh, the Nobel Prize uh, uh, incident or issues, um, and then also a quick question for Aki uh, Tanami: Are Japan and the United uh, are Japan and China working together on on the Arctic issues uh, since both nations uh, do wish to have a louder voice? Thank you. Okay, Willie, Anne Marie, and Aki, one minute answers, please. Okay, Ladies so that's a. Uh, a good question um, to ask, but I think it's a little bit, um, in some ways, a little bit out of date. And in some ways, what we knew in the media and what was actually going on between the countries or the diplomats is another story. China and uh, was very and is very critical about um, the the um, awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to Liu Xiaobo. However. Um, there are, we're always continuing Norwegian uh, connections, polar connections, um, which we're expanding at the time that China is constantly giving, publicly giving Norway a hard time. <coughs> and um, Norway said in public that they are not using the Arctic Council card to try and get China to be nice to them. Um, so I think that it's just a typical situation in international relations is by, I think it was Henry Kissinger uh, was told by Mao Zedong when he visited that the US would, that China would continue to say that the US was a great imperial power, but he said, don't you worry about that, that's the sound of empty cannons. You know, and the actual relationship was expanding and growing. So um, I, I don't think it's um, quite what we hear about. And I think, at, at the very least, it's improved a lot in recent times. It was actually just reported today that China called the United States a mincing rascal. This doesn't sound nearly as ominous as a great imperial power, you know, a mincing rascal. <laughs> Willie, why don't we stay with Norway, and then we'll finish with Aki. Yeah, well, well I, I think I have some news here. And, and that is that uh, Huang Nubel, who tried to buy land in Iceland, in 2011 uh, for tourist uh, uh, reasons. He was declined in Iceland. Now he has bought a huge property on mainland Norway uh, in Troms, which is part of the Arctic. And not only that, there has been a release of some uh, property in the archipelago of Svalbard. 
which is um, approximately two uh, 280 square kilometers big, just north of Longyearbyen, which is the capital up there. And he has already uh, a bid in for that property. Uh, so he's, uh, he, he may actually have a foothold in the archipelago of Svalbard, and then China will have a foothold in the Arctic. But really, Lily, the, uh, Willie, he's not representing the Chinese government, so that you do need to make a distinction between Huang Lubo and Beijing. Well, you know, you know uh, Beijing do not make a distinction between the Nobel Peace Prize and the Norwegian government. It's not quite the same. <laughs> <laughs> Aki. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, China and Japan working together. Um, and um, among scientists, uh, yes. And there is a strong want from both parties to uh, um, accelerate working together. Uh, for example, uh, and in fact, um, um, the head of uh, Polar Research Institute of China, he uh, spent a few years in Japan at P uh, National Polar Research Institute, and he speaks um, very good Japanese, um, um, and um, uh, particularly in Anta Antarctica, um, the scientists work together, and uh, they do have uh, very good communications. And, um, and uh, also in uh, business sector, uh, they see a strong uh, necessity. Uh, there's a strong. Uh, they see a necessity in working together, and particularly uh, building uh, infrastructure necessary for port um, uh, and port management. However, um, political uh, tension between the two countries, uh, actually including South Korea, so it would be uh, three countries, um, mutual suspicion, historical grievances, they uh, prevent uh, further uh, cooperation. So it is actually my policy recommendations to uh, um, take advantage of uh, the Arctic or Arctic Affairs or Arctic Council as uh, a venue for uh, to put these things aside and uh, uh, promote um, uh, a bilateral or trilateral cooperation between uh, East Asian countries. Well, I would like to thank all of our panelists, Heather Conley, Marlene Laruel, <laughs> Rob Hubert, Willie Ostring, Aki Tanami, and Anne-Marie Brady for a terrific program. And thanks to all of you for joining us and for staying even after the coffee ran, uh, ran out. Do keep an eye on further programs from the Wilson Center's new Polar Initiative and look to for an email that shows you how to sign up for Polar Poll for, for more information on polar issues as well as information on how to subscribe to the Polar Journal should you be interested. Once again, on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson Center, thank you very much. Wow, great. Oh, well, but if we get to that point, then we can get to the other side, too.